Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents Climbing Higher, Going Deeper. I'm Chris McGregor, your guide through the spiritual landscape of some of the 20th century's most profound writers whose voices resonate powerfully in today's world. In our current series, I'm joined by Vivian Dudrow to delve into the life and works of Gertrude von Lefort, a German author known for her novels, poems, and essays. Her work, renowned for its depth and artistry, beautifully intertwines timely, thought-provoking ideas with a refined yet accessible elegance. A Protestant of Huguenot descent, von Lefort's journey to Catholicism profoundly influenced her writing, infusing it with rich theological insights. To enhance your journey, we invite you to check the show notes for essential highlights, study and reflection questions, and additional resources. So join us as we embark on this illuminating journey through the compelling world of Gertrude von Lefort. Hi everyone, this is Chris McGregor, welcome to this very special Discerning Hearts series, which will be breaking open the work of Gertrude von Lefort. And in particular, we're gonna start out with a book, The Eternal Woman, The Timeless Meaning of the Feminine. We're gonna look at a lot of Gertrude von Lefort's work. We're gonna discuss her thoughts, and we want you to get to know her. And to be able to do this, I had to go to my dear friend, uh, you are familiar with her because many of you have heard her on Discerning Hearts, and uh, I'm excited. I'm so excited to be doing this with Vivian Dudrow. Vivian, thank you for joining me. Oh, you're so welcome, Chris. It's a pleasure for me to do this with you. Some may know that you are, I think, a very important person at Ignatius Press. You are an editor. An editor is... The, one of the unsung heroes when it comes to giving a critical look, a very important eye to not only literary works, but works of theology and so many other things to make sure that it is expressed in a way that uh, connects the thoughts of the author to those who are the readers. And uh, to be able to bring forward Gertrude von Lefort, I couldn't I couldn't think of another person better than you. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. Tell me how you got to know Gertrude von Lefort. How did you first encounter her? Working at Ignatius Press, we received in the mail a copy of this book, The Eternal Woman, sent by, I don't remember who it was, was, the, was the sender, and uh, urging us to republish the work because it had gone out of print. And so we read it and we thought, wow, this is a real gem. It deserves to be in print. It deserves to be widely read. And then we connected the dots between this book and The Song at the Scaffold, which is the work that Gertrude von Lefort is probably the most famous for here in the United States. And we brought that back into print too. And then we found some of her short stories, brought those into print. And now we're working on her autobiography. So, yes, Yay. thank you. Yay. Yes, thank you to that person, whoever she was, who first uh, sent us that work and told us to do this because, wow, it really opened up uh, a very rich field of, of, of study and prayer. Uh, I'm very grateful for it. This was an important work in the 20th century. Many people, particularly in Europe, were very familiar with it. The issue that comes up so often is the scholarship to be able to translate, in particular, theological works. Now, she isn't necessarily, or maybe, she, well, I think she was, and in, in later in her life, considered a theologian, as it were. But at the time, um, her work, because it was written in German, it's, it's difficult to translate German theology, German thought, uh, appropriately into English. I, it's, a, it's quite a skill, don't you think? Yes, and it's even harder to translate from any language literary works because mm. the language is often symbolic and metaphorical. And it's very difficult sometimes 
to translate those into another language because if you just translate it literally, it might just come across as nonsense in another language. For example, the cat's got your tongue is something we say in English to mean you, you're stuck on your words, you can't get them out of your mouth. But if I were uh, translating that from English to other language, literally, and in that mm -hmm. other language, they don't have that expression to mean that. And in their mind, they see a cat hanging onto your tongue. <laughs> you know, right. it wouldn't make any sense. And so a good translator will say, oh, okay, so now I need to know the language and culture I'm translating into well enough to know what they say to mean that. Same thing. And then put that in, not a literal translation of the cat, okay? So, uh, yes, translation is a real skill. It's an art, really. And um, it's not easy. And a lot of people take it for granted because now we have all these technologies that do automatic translating, right? And if you've ever done a Google Translate or something like that, you'll see the gaps, okay? Uh, no, a machine cannot replace the human understanding that's involved. Yeah, I didn't appreciate what true scholarship was until I had a conversation with Dr. Peter Craved. And I termed him, and you know Ignatius Press has published so much of his works, and, and people would assume that he's a scholar, a, a theological scholar. And when I said that to him one day, he said, oh, no, Chris, I'm not a scholar. And I, what? <laughs> and he said, no, I'm a philosopher. But to be a true scholar, you need to go back and, and actually know the language to be able to go to the source of your, who, what you are studying or who you are studying and to be able to take their thought and look at those words and to be able to communicate effectively what that theologian or, as you said, or an author is trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. Because if it's done poorly, all kinds of problems happen. That's for sure. And, you know, so I, I think it's, it, I, that's one of the reasons why we're not as familiar with her work. This particular book, The Eternal Woman, was actually published in 1934. And it would not come to the shores of America until 1954, 20 years later. And it was originally uh, in essay form through Commonweal. And then eventually the publisher who had it originally done it 20 years prior was able to put it in the United States. But then it kind of got lost because that publisher's name was not necessarily one who was well known in this area and maybe had the marketing capabilities of, say, a Sheed and Ward. So uh, thank goodness that Ignatius Press picked it up because otherwise we may not uh, be as familiar with it as they are, say, in Europe. So it's a real gift to us, isn't it? I think so, and I'm glad you appreciate it. I do. I appreciate it a lot. <clears throat> Why don't we talk about who Gertrude von Lefort is? Because I remember when we first put this out, that we that this particular study, uh, the episodes that are we're going to be taking a look at over the course of the weeks to come, uh, they saw Gertrude von Lefort and they didn't know who she was. Who is this person? And then you mentioned, as you did, the song of the scaffold, and all of a sudden, ding. Okay, mm -hmm. they may know that, but let's talk about who she is and why she's so important. Yes, well, uh, she was born in. Um in uh, 1876 in, in northern Germany, and uh, she was of French descent. Her, her parents were French arist uh, from French aristocrats, and they had left France uh, because they were Protestants. They left during the horrible persecution of Protestants in France. Some people might recall the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, they settled in Prussia, and her father uh, ended up becoming an officer in the Prussian army. And basically, the army of Prussia was involved in so many wars in the 19th century and 20th century. I mean, when Germany became Germany, and now the Prussian army is the army of Germany, okay? She came from this military family and lived through all of these major wars, World War I, World War II. And yet uh, she had a lovely childhood by all accounts and mm -hmm. growing up, you know, probably on her family's estate and so on. He was a baron. 
He was a baron, her, was and a baron. she that makes her a baroness, by the way. Mm -hmm. She's Baroness Gertrude von Lefort. That's right. And so uh, she received a, a, a charmed education at home at first, but she was sent, she ended up going to three different German universities. Not one, not two, three. Berlin, Heidelberg, Magdeburg. This woman was highly educated, probably spoke several languages fluently, studied history, philosophy, and uh, literature. Now let's yes. think about that real quick. Let's take it let's, for a timeline. It's 1876, she's born. She goes off to university. So this is, can we say 1890s, late 1890s, uh, going at, to the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So she's born in that period, that intellectual thought of all the isms, are all starting to come out that Pope Leo the 13th would talk about. That's right. Now the effects of all those isms as this young 20 year old woman into her studying is beginning to occur. And I, you know, we, we talked about this before we got started. We were trying to compare what, what we knew about the wars, the Prussian wars. And you mentioned a war I wasn't familiar with. And I mentioned a war you weren't familiar with. I mean, they, there was conflicts going on in, in practically in her backyard all the time. That's right. Constant warfare. And by the way, in her backyard, one of the short stories we're going to get to late, later is precisely about a war going on in a woman's backyard. And, there uh, you go. And, and uh, so, yes, she, she uh, lived through uh, European warfare and was from a military aristocratic family and was well acquainted with history and all of this and as you say chris this is the era when these ideologies uh trying to find a uh, a human understanding of man without god in it right mm -hmm. and trying to improve his lot in this world without recourse to god or faith these great ideologies great meaning having huge impact communism uh, or positivism rather and uh and uh and nazism they all have the same roots they all have the same intellectual roots and europe the european universities were the places where all of this stuff was gurgling and bubbling up and it would have been doing that when she was a student so she was certainly well versed in what was going on philosophically mm -hmm. as well as historically in her time well and we're going to talk about this in in uh, episodes to come as we explore the book. But now that you we brought up the isms, we also have to talk about the changing role of women. I'm going to bring that up now, Vivian, just real briefly, because the dynamics, again, this is around the, the movement from the 1800s into the 1900s. There, uh, there are women who are working in shops and uh, factories the role of the woman who is the mother, the, the, the classes are changing. There's the, the lower class, middle class now, and the upper middle class. The, the dynamics within communities, it's a, it, there's a lot going on. There I, is a lot I, going I on. I can't think of another dynamic in human history where there, everything is changing. That's right. Rather quickly at a breakneck speed. That's right. And the Industrial Revolution is what ushered in a lot of these economic upheavals, right? Mm -hmm. And and the growing middle class. And uh, and she's going to witness first wave feminism, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the first women, I mean, she herself, to be this educated, I mean, there were few men with an education like hers, never mind women as educated as she was. That's right. And so she uh, w would have been seeing all of these social changes, economic changes, cultural changes, all happening in a big swirl all around her and having, but, and having obviously a very gifted mind and heart and soul to be able to discern uh, the difference between truth and error, right? Which is why, as we know, she becomes a Catholic at the age of 50 in 1926. So she clearly was a woman of profound um, thought and contemplation. We know that she was a poet, as well as uh, a writer of essays and fiction. So very gifted, gifted 
person, period, whether male or female, she's an extremely gifted person and uh, puts all of that to work uh, in bringing forth these beautiful works of, of prose and, and poetry and fiction uh, that, that reveal the depth of her thought. Yeah, I love the I love the fact that she when she would visit Rome and she studied in Rome, she would actually be received in the church at Santa Maria Alamana, which is just if for anybody that's been in Rome, it's just east of the Piazza Novano. It's one of those gorgeous um it's just one of those the nationalities kind of claim a particular church often. If you're if you're American, there's an American church you could visit and same for the french but this is the the german prussian church many of uh, the unknown soldiers of those prussian wars especially with italy their remains are there uh, to be venerated and this is where she i love visiting there because i I, sometimes i know you might think i'm crazy vivian but it's you know I, i i remember going in once and i thought i wonder if she sat in this pew i wonder if she knelt at this altar because yeah, it's, um, it made it, it made it very real for me to be at that place. And she became somebody I I really um, I didn't know her as well as I think I understand her now, but um, that and she did that after her parents passed. She waited. So the, the religion, I, I think, faith must might have been important. I don't know that for sure. I can't wait to the auto. Her, is it an autobiography or a biography yes. that Ignatius Press is going to be putting out? We're currently translating soon. her autobiography, the okay. title of which is Love Beyond Fear, which mm. anyone who's familiar with her work, especially the song at the scaffold, will know that that title is very much a theme in all of her work and uh, a theme of her own life. And so uh, I can't wait to read it myself. It's not finished being translated yet, but it's being worked on right now. And I'm very eager to read the English translation when it's ready. Well, I I mentioned that just because it, uh, I think if, if her sensitivity, if she grew up in a family, I mean, this, this uh, appreciation of the spiritual, the, of, of God's grace, of Christ. I mean, it seems as though she's always steeped in it. So this is a woman who, that's the fruitfulness that's coming forward. I mean, it's not something like it was a bolt of lightning for her, but it no. was something that was nurtured and um, and it grew. And I think that's why the expression of it, if I'm not mistaken, again, her uh, hymn of the world was the, the actual uh, work that was the one that was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature, and hymns most of to us the don't church, even hymns, hymns, to, hymns the church, to the church, which is which is uh, 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 poetry, and she was mm-hmm. nominated for the Nobel Prize by Hermann Hesse, another famous German author. Um, she w- was friends with, which I'm one of the things I'm looking forward to in her autobiography is to see these relationships with these other people because we can kind of piece together or infer certain things. Like, for example, Chris, you've mentioned that she corresponded with Edith Stein. Mm -hmm. Uh, We know that she was friends with Hermann Hesse. We know she was friends with Berninos, the the French uh, playwright and, and author, because she let him use her novel, The Song at the Scaffold, to write his play called The Dialogues of the Carmelites, which then was turned into an opera by Poulenc. So she was also of this generation of European, um, educated European artists, writers, who all knew each other and all corresponded with each other and all uh, esteemed each other's works and so on. I mean, she uh, that's one of the things I'm really excited about reading is the people that she knew personally uh, will come forward in ways that we can only guess at right now with the little that we know. Yeah, it still it surprises me that we don't have more scholarship on her. Why do you suppose that is? Because this 
is a very important work. I mean, as the themes that we're going to be, oh, let me turn it around. Inc incredibly necessary. I, I, let's just go to that foreword by Alice von Hildebrandt that was, uh, that she penned for the book when Ignatius Press uh, decided to thankfully bring it back out into publication for the rest of us. I mean, she, of course, was the wife of Dietrich von Hildebrandt. Right, and as as uh, we surmised, uh, she must have known Dietrich von Hildebrand, and he know, mm -hmm. knew, knew her in terms of the German-speaking world. Those who would have been on their level, educationally, culturally, his name has a fun in it, so he too is from an aristocratic background. They uh, both had a love for cats, by the way. Oh, interesting. I think that I think she mentions that in the foreword. I thought that was a little neat f a footnote. Right. That, you know, she uh, uh, Gertrude von Lefort loved cats, and I didn't know that Dietrich von Hildebrand actually raised cats. And, and so, uh, and they, and he, as we know, he was uh, he was in Austria. He was against Nazism mm -hmm. when um, Germany annexed Austria in 1938. Uh, Nazi Germany annexed Austria in 1938. That's when Dietrich von Hildebrand had to flee, uh, so, and came eventually here to America, because he was on the blacklist. He would have been arrested and probably executed if not just sent to a concentration camp to wither and die there. But the point is, is that the intelligentsia, the Catholic by then, she, Gertrude von Lefort would have been Catholic, so the Catholic intelligentsia, they all knew who each other were. Who were, who were resisting the modern philosophies that were turning into these hateful, violent ideologies, they would have known who each other were. And so um, it's very fitting that Alice von Hildebrand, the wife of Dietrich von Hildebrand, wrote the foreword to our 2010 edition of this book. And she uh, kind of sums up, so what is this book about, you know? Um, she says, well, in short, it's about the uh, role of woman in the salvation of the world. Oh, is that all? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she... Just a little uh, topic. Yeah, Just a yeah, little topic there. Yeah, small topic. Uh, and then she ends the uh, foreword by pointing to the major theme of this book and all of her works, which is, uh, this is how Alice von Hildebrand put it, this gem of a book is a sublime meditation on the words of St. Paul. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It is when we acknowledge our helplessness that God's power is made manifest in us. And acknowledge our helplessness in the sense that we are creatures of God. Everything we have comes from God. We have no agency without God. We have no gifts without God. It's not until we acknowledge that truth about ourselves, that we're creatures of God, made human, male and female, he created them. Mm -hmm. And it's not until we give that gift of ourselves in an act of surrender that we really understand and accept who we are and are free now to do God's will out of love, not out of being controlled, not out of fear, not out of being coerced. But out of oh, an but we don't of, like the word surrender because then I don't have any power, Vivian. I don't have any control. You're asking me to surrender? What does that mean? Well, the I mean, paradox. Of, been, yes, good question. What does it mean? And the paradox of it, I don't have any control. No, actually, it takes a tremendous act of freedom on your part. Mm -hmm. You being in control of yourself and exercising right. your freedom to the greatest degree to give the gift of yourself freely out of love. This is the greatest act of freedom you could ever do. It's what your freedom actually was given to you to do because you're not going to be happy. You're not going to find fulfillment as to who you are until you do. But God isn't going well, to... See, that's... Go on. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. You no, get you me go all on. excited. Okay, but well, and see, that's the thing. That's the dynamic of the Trinity, because God is love, right? We know that from St. John. And so love by its very nature has to be shared. Yes. So, of course, the Son. So he, that immediately, that's why we say consubstantial with the Father. He, uh, absolutely, the nature of the Son, because it's love. 
That's right. That the father shares with the son, and the share uh, the sharing is returned. The gift of that is a, a sharing from the son to the father, and that dynamic of back and forth, and then you have the Holy Spirit. That's right. So it's the son receives, and then he gives, and then he gives back. That's right. And so that very dynamic of who we are to be a receiver and then to give back, to surrender, and to and and that I think is what needs to be articulated in a in a way that I think can help us understand the nature of what it is to be truly female. I'm not trying to be esoteric in that, but it that's why she will bring forward in this book and as we look at this, the, the par excellence of that fiat, that yes, the, the surrendering, a free gift of the will to say, I surrender to let it be done. Whatever that's going to be, let it be done unto me. That's right. And, uh, and that's why Mary is the, the incredible archetype. She's the one that she will bring forward and help us to understand. And this isn't just a, a, a so deep that we can't grasp it. It's, the, it's filled with the aha moments. Yes. Like, oh, I knew that, but I didn't know I knew that. Um, but it, it gives us a glimpse of, of the Blessed Virgin and why she's such an important role. But it has to be more than just a reflection on the Blessed Virgin because it becomes a reflection about us. That's right. About you, about me. That's right. Because Male and female, because this is as much for guys as it is for women. Because you don't understand one without the other. It is, this isn't right. a book about femininity. This isn't a book on womanhood and domesticity and all of that. It is a book, a profound book on what it means to be human and what the different oh, signs of male and female signify for our understanding of what it means to be human. And so you mentioned the son, the obedience of the son to the father out of love because of the father begetting the son and the giftedness of that and now the son returns and so on. This, this, this is the very life of God himself. And so in order for us to create us into his image, this communion of persons, well, he creates us male and female in order to work out this communion of persons in our lives and we, have, we need to understand ourselves in order to live that out. And that's what this book helps us to do. And it is a paradox, though, that uh, th in the foreword by this uh, Max Jordan, the for uh, this say is the something about him. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so this was the foreword. This was the foreword that uh, accompanied the 1954 English edition of The Eternal Woman. And Max Jordan, he was a newspaper reporter for Hearst Newspapers, and then during the Second World War, he became a radio reporter and that, in Europe. And then after the war, he became a Benedictine monk, and he knew I Gertrude like von Lefort. He knew Gertrude von Lefort personally. I mean, he probably has a life story worth knowing about, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he points out here, you know, um, this 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 paradox of helplessness meaning understanding your own powerlessness, uh, being becoming turned into strength and power. As he says, for by surrendering the, cre by surrendering, the creature becomes co-powerful with the creator, which is what you were just saying, Chris, about the, the inner life of the Trinity. By surrendering, the creature becomes co-powerful with the creator. All the achievements of man depend on this primary act of creative surrender, which leads to divine partnership. It's like God is just waiting for us to say yes, to bring us into the life of the very Trinity itself. All right, so why is the sign of the woman so important in understanding this? Because as Gertrude von Lefort is going to explain, the sign of the woman, the sign of Mary, sort of shows the way. Her yes, Mary's yes, precedes the yes of Jesus in Gethsemane, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. why? Because in the garden story, we have Eve being the first to reject being a creature. So now woman is given a chance to redeem herself, cope with Christ, of course, by being given the opportunity to say yes. And now that 
fruitfulness of that yes being what bears Christ into the world for the redemption of all. And we have a role, each of us women have a role to play in bearing this sign ourselves and helping men to understand their yes to God by first understanding our yes to God. They have to say yes to God too. And it's interesting that this Max Jordan also quotes of all people, C.S. Lewis, right? I that. Yes. I love that. I mean, it was incredible the to find, Anglican to find this in here. Yeah. Uh, what Gertrude von Lefort says as a Catholic, others have expressed just as convincingly from their own demo, uh, denominational perspective. C.S. Lewis, when he wrote, quote, Our role must always be that of patient to agent, female to male, mirror to light, echo to voice. What Lewis is describing here is that Every soul, in this sense, is female. As you said, Chris, we first have to receive in order to return what we've received. So the first step is the reception of someone, of God. We'll return to Climbing Higher, Going Deeper in just a moment. Hi, this is Chris McGregor here to encourage you to check out the show notes for essential highlights study and reflection questions, and additional resources for this episode you're listening to right now. They're offered to you freely by Discerning Hearts. We hope you'll take this opportunity to study for yourself or to share it with a group. And if you have any questions, concerns, or ideas, be sure to leave the comments in the comm section of this particular posting. Now, back to our program. We now return to Climbing Higher, Going Deeper. When you think about, let's go back to that Trinity and the dynamics of the, the action of the Trinity. The Father, of course, uh, is sharing with the Son. The Son receives, and then the, the Son shares with the Father, and then the Father receives, and it's the back and forth. The role of the Holy Spirit, in essence, because of the three persons of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit turns to us. The fruitfulness of that turns to us and wishes to share it's a sharing of the divine life. Yes. And what is Mary saying as the receiver? Yes. She's overshadowed by what? The Holy Spirit comes upon her and she receives the Holy Spirit. And then she in her yes is sharing back by the suffering that she will have to endure, by the love that she will share. There are so many other ways in which the Blessed Virgin in that yes, in that surrender, becomes the bearer of unbelievable fruit. That's right. I mean, an incredible experience. And that's what happens to us. Every yes that we say, every fiat that we give, and every little thing, as Therese will tell us, every little thing, that is the spirit is in that action. We receive, and then our response is the surrender. Am I, do you, do you think I'm, I'm, I'm there with that. You yes, and this that? pattern is all over nature. I mean, mm -hmm. think of any fruit, of any plant. The only way fruit comes forth is by the female parts of the plant receiving the male parts of the plant. And now the joining of these two is what produces fruit. So now think... In order for me to bear fruit in my life, whether I'm a man or a woman, I am going to have to receive the initiative from God. He's the creator, not I. I'm not the creator. That's right. I receive the gifts of the creator. And I say yes to them. I welcome them. I welcome them into my life, which requires an act of trust and, 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 and trust in God's love, trust in the creator's love for his And to creatures. be able to say whatever. To be able to say, I don't know where this is going, Lord, but you're the you're the That's one taking right. the initiative here. You're the one taking the initiative. You want to give me gifts. You want to give me yourself. And I need to say yes, because God is a gentleman. He is not going to force himself on anyone. And I say whatever in the in the great whatever of Our Lady. It's not, you know, I think in today's world, we look at, quote unquote, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I mean that in all reverence. But as something that I'm going to order from the, uh, you know, the heavenly Amazon, and I'm going to get what I've ordered, right. and I'm going to receive it, right? And then somehow the Holy Spirit is going to do my bidding. 
No, the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that sharing of the divine life. And even the Father has said that, you know, sometimes I'll give you my gifts, but you're falling in love with the gifts and not the giver. And sometimes I have to pull back from them. He told Catherine of Siena that in the dialogues. I think it's number eight. But, you know, sometimes I have to pull those things away because they're not doing you any good. And that's the imbalance, the wanting, the control, and in some ways the dominance that has shifted everything off kilter. And there was never a time where it went more off kilter than in that turn into the 19th century. That's right. That's when it really... And we go back and really look at this it and really got knocked off kilter. And we're still living in that, in the results of that. Because I know it's like a balance being, that's just not coming back into balance. That's it's right. The balance there. we are we we are off balance because the the modern mind shaped by modern thought. The starting point of of it is that man makes himself. That's right. Okay. And if your starting point is that man makes yourself, ma- makes himself, and makes everything and dominates the world through his powers and his mind and so on, this is going to sever that receptivity to God and throw everything out of whack. And so women probably suffer more profoundly in this state of out of kilterness that we're all in because she is the sign of receptivity if you're going to say to society at large receptivity has no value we're not talking about fruitfulness we're talking about power we're talking about dominance we're talking about putting yourself out there we're talking about productivity which is different from fruitfulness, okay? That's right, yeah. What what value does the woman as mother really have in this kind of world? Even, even if she's not biologically a mother, she's still spiritually a mother. What value does that whole feminine receptivity that bears fruit into the world, what value does that have in a world that has become dominated by this mentality? I'll tell you what, and, zero. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, can I offer this real quick? I mean, you set this up so well, Vivian. Um, the when you talk about the biological motherhood, it it they'll go back to what we just talked about in that reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit, in that the the Father desires to share with us, and that fruitfulness we receive it, and then we bear it out. Now, what do, now what's it going to look like? It's going to look like a life of virtue. It's going to look like the Beatitudes. It's going to bear all those hallmarks out into the world. It's going to be a light bearer, right? Because Jesus is the light of the world. That that type of maternal nurturing and loving and fruitfulness, it may be, the, again, the great whatever. It may produce a child in the womb and be carried, and yet there's another one to love, a creation of God. But it also that fruitfulness may be may not have that uh, dynamic of a child being born in a womb, but it could be the nurturing of a child who does not have a mother. It could be the nurturing of a community that needs a guidance of the maternal figure who needs to be nurtured by the virtues, needs to be vir- nurtured by the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the dynamic of that self, that soul, that wants to share. Does that all make sense? Yes, it does, because by what we mean by receptivity of, of, of the maternal, we're talking about the receptivity, first of all, to God and his gifts, whatever he wishes to send. Whatever. Okay, this means now a profound openness to other human beings. Amen. Okay. Whichever human beings God chooses to send to you, you will love with that welcome and that warmth that is is the maternal love, right? You aren't the one who gets to decide who comes through the door. You're not the one who gets to decide, you know, who is in your community who might need your care. 
The, this receptivity means receiving the person as he is, however he's sent to me by God. And that's why when, and, and that, my friends, is receiving God himself. When Jesus takes that child and puts him in front of his apostles, he says, anyone who receives a child like this receives me. Mm -hmm. That's right. Receives me. This, if we close ourselves off to being receptive to what God sends, we are closing ourselves off to love. We are closing ourselves off to God himself. We have to re-soften our hearts, reopen our hearts. We have to pray for this because we can't do it ourselves. We have to pray for God to take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh, open to hearing what he has to say, receiving the people he sends into our life, loving them with the love he gives us to share. And this, if women stop doing this, this is what John Paul II said in his encyclical letter on, on the vocation of women. He said, Women are, of course, the only ones caused to, called to love. We are all called to this love. But if women stop doing it, will we know what it is? That's right. John Paul II even goes further and says that the father learns his paternity from the mother who first is called to accept the child. Her mm -hmm. maternity opens the way for his paternity. If the woman is close to the child, which means close to God, which means close to whatever person God wants to send through the door, right? How is the man supposed to know what love is when she's the sign of what it is? That's what Gertrude von Lefort is going to explore in this book, how critical this is for us to understand. And, you know, I, we don't have time to break it all open in, in this particular segment, Vivian, but, you know, this is, this is so Eucharistic. Oh, All for sure. It's such a Eucharist. It's no wonder she went into that church that day. And she said yes, because Gertrude von Lefort understood that. And that's why she needed, that's why she desired. And she responded at 50 to the yes to come into the full communion, the communication, the communion of that love by coming into the Catholic Church. Because when we receive the Lord in communion, Okay, mm -hmm. we are in that sense, the female part of the flower, all of us, whether you're a man right. or a woman, you're the bride. He's the bridegroom. This is the nuptial meaning of the Eucharist. We're the bride waiting for the bridegroom. The bridegroom gives the gift of himself to us. We take him into ourselves. And that is supposed to bear fruit in our lives. Out the church, we take Jesus right out with us into the world. Right. So you're That's absolutely right. right, Chris. That's brilliant. That the Eucharist, we don't understand the Eucharist if we don't understand oh. this, what Gertrude von Lefort's talking about. We don't, and we wonder, we want to have a Eucharistic revival and we all talk about it. It's all head. It's all head in what you, it, it's, you have to make it, even the instructions, and we're trying to tell people about the Eucharistic revival, it's all talk unless you understand this first that's right the first fiat the first vow the first yes so every time you go up to receive communion when you're in there and you're presented the body of christ you say amen let it be you understand the yes mm -hmm. the fiat because it's supposed to because become transformative not just a part of a, a communal gathering where you feel like i have to re you know i want to re receive communion hosts and that's good. And I'm not trying to, and I, and I don't mean, I'm not in judgment, but there's something more. There's a magic that Ignatius talks about. There's the more that it, you can experience. It's the expansion of a pregnancy. It, you just grow. And, and in a very real way, we become like, um, it, and now I'm really stretching it, aren't I? But it's, it's like a, the pregnancy of our souls. Yes. We just grow. Yes. And it, you, and it bears fruit for the world. And it bears fruit it for the out. world. So so it's true that you can stretch these metaphors too far, no pun intended, right, Chris? Stretch. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't uh, we, we, we can stretch these things so far that they sound like nonsense, but we can't lose sight of how powerful symbolic language is. And if we cut ourselves off to trying to understand what the symbols are saying, to receive it, okay, and then... 
you know, not get weird well, about it. Not get weird. Now I'm all excited again because I, I'm cutting you off again only because this is what the beauty of the experience of the female mystic. Yes. This is, this is what female mystics do. They have a way to describe things that are visionary in their aspect. And it was Benedict XVI that in his audiences right at the very beginning in the August of 2010 that talked about the importance of the female mystical experience of those women because they have a way of describing things that theology truly, truly needs. Right. The scholastic dynamics, very important. All the, I'm not trying to uh, truncate that, but it wasn't me that said it. It was Pope Benedict. That's right. He, you know, in describing the importance of understanding, because the, the female has a way of showing, presenting the universe. I think it was Chesterton. It, it, I'm, now I'm, I'm pulling from him. But Chesterton talked about how the male is called to toil and to work and to protect, safeguard the family, bring home, nur- you know, in, in his way, nurture. But the female with the children presents to them the world, the universe. She's in- got, yes, she's, she's, men tend to compartmentalize, right, and become specialists mm-hmm. and become. Um, and that's good. And that's what, and you know, we need them to do that, but. But but to keep the whole in view, right, uh, is 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 so that's what Gertrude von Lefort does. And that's and you're right. That's what mystics do, too. She probably was a mystic. She was a mystical poet. And so uh, properly understood. That's what mysticism is. It's a hearing. It's a receiving. It's a seeing. And not because I've taken the initiative, but because God has come to me. And now if that's got to, that's got to bear fruit though, I can't just be off in my ecstasies in the corner right. and not have a fruitfulness in my life. Right. Um, we don't make saints just because they have ecstasies in corners. The church names saints because of the fruitfulness of their life. Mm-hmm. So if you cut off the ecstasy from the fruit, you get weird spirituality and weird sensuality and weird sex because these things mm-hmm. have to go together. So, yes, uh, we have a lot of homework to do here, but I, I would not want to put anyone off that while this is dense and you have to read it slowly and really prayerfully, uh, it's so rich and stuff's just going to start jumping out at you and you're going to be so glad that you took the effort. And we're going to try to make it easier, aren't we, Chris, by doing it together? Yes, we are. And what we'll have in the show notes uh, that you can find not only in the post on discerninghearts.com or, or the podcast show notes, uh, you'll see it on the YouTube and the video notes, uh, discussion questions, reflection questions, that as you're, as you're reading The Eternal Woman and you're listening possibly to us and you want to go back and you want to kind of reflect on your own, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get your comments. We'd love to get your feedback, your thoughts. Uh, so that we can incorporate that somehow in, in our conversations. But um, this should be something that, you know, we're, I'm hoping that we'll have a lot of scholars. I'm hoping there are seminarians out there. I hope there are those who are deepening their academic understanding, uh, theological training. They'll go back and they'll do dissertations, theses, on uh, different things involving Gertrude von Lefort and her understanding of the eternal woman. It, uh, I think it's, it can only help us. I think it's a, it's a gift that can continue. And I'm, I'm so excited. And you're such a good friend, Vivian. I was even talking over you a couple times. So if people think I'm rude, I probably was. It's so I'm sorry. just because but you're I'm excited. It's your, yes, you're bubbling over with enthusiasm. And that's a good thing. I am. I am. And then you, trust me, Vivian will be bubbling up too. <laughs> she, she's a bubbler. <laughs> I'm a bubbler. <laughs> I know I'm loving it. Vivian, any final thoughts? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think we've covered a lot, Chris, in this first session. Yeah, Ignatius Press is also offering uh, on those links that you'll find below uh, the ability to be able to get this at a discount. So you're going to want to do that. And her other works, because we're going to take a look at the Song of the Scaffold. We're going to revisit an old friend, aren't we, Vivian? We are. We're um, going to look at her short yeah. stories as well, because they're just they're phenomenal. Pilot's wife, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And Veronica's Veil. Isn't it Veronica's Veil? Uh, I think that's the Veil of Veronica. That, 
I think it's the Battle of the... That was the first one. I think that was their first work. Well, and that's but, a novel, which rereading this for this uh, session, Chris, I realized, oh my goodness, we should track that down and try to get that translated, the, the, the Veil of Veronica, or figure out where oh that gosh, went. This so, is the beginning of a whole new renaissance. It's the, it's the whole renaissance of Gertrude von Lefort. Yes. Can't you see it? Yes. It's really needed right now with all of this confusion, spiritual confusion and sexual confusion. And, you know, we really need to get back to basics on what it means to be made in the image of God. Absolutely. Uh, we'll be beginning with uh, the introduction in our next episode, the introduction of the book. <laughs> it's going to be, it's such a little a couple pages, but it's so packed. I mean, whoa. I know. I think I've underlined I every wait. word. <laughs> I can't wait. All right, Vivian, my dearest of friends, thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Okie doke. Bye. You've been listening to Climbing Higher, Going Deeper. As we've been discussing the life and works of Gertrude von Lefort. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it in the Discerning Hearts free app or wherever you find your podcasts. Be sure to check out the show notes for this particular episode for essential highlights, study and reflection questions, and additional resources. We hope this will deepen your engagement with Gertrude von Lefort's spiritual and theological contributions. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Climbing Higher, Going Deeper.